Good evening, everybody. How is everybody doing tonight? I pray that everyone is doing well. Let's get started with a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the blessing of coming together once more to study your word, to learn about our lives in you, our lives of grace. Bless us now, O oh God. Give us what we need tonight to be better disciples. And we ask it and claim it in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out, braving, braving the rain. Let's um, continue our conversation on the soul. This is the sister's season takeover of um, Tuesday night Bible study, and we're studying about the soul. And the handout you have in front of you and the material that will be on the screens starts with an account that was excerpted from the book Soul Keeping, Caring for the, main, the Most Important Part of You by John Ortberg. Ortberg. And this is written by Dr. Henry Cloud. It's a reflection on something that happened in his, his practice. So let's just read through it very quickly. I was a clinical director of a Christian psychiatric hospital, and we were having the weekly meeting we called staffing. It was a time each Wednesday when the doctors, psychologists, nurses, th therapists, art and music therapists, and group therapists all together got together to go over each patient's treatment. We would talk about what was happening with them in the groups and in their individual therapy, their progress and their action, and our action plans to help. I loved this time each week. It was a rich time of seeing a group of dedicated professionals come together to truly care for, discuss, and plan goodness for the people they were trying to help. We celebrated patients' successes, breakthroughs, and the like, and we agonized over their difficulties and misfortunes. It was one of the best examples of community love I have ever seen, people bringing their gifts together in the service of others. Sarah did it last night and at family and friend group. She finally told her mother that she was not going to take the job mom has been pressuring her to take and was going to figure out her own path. It was awesome, a nurse reported. We all cheered as we experienced the fruitfulness of Sarah's hard work. Alex is having a hard time this week. He found out that his uncle who has held him together is moving and he's afraid of what he's going to do without him. His fear, he fears going back to drugs and old friends, his therapist reported. Susan is gearing up for discharge. She had a great, she has done great, ready to go back to grad school now, energy has returned and she's stable. I think everything is in place. Depression is gone and she hasn't binged or purged at all said Susan, psychologist. We were all happy for her. Then came the moment I will always remember. It was a time to talk about Maddie, and I could tell everyone's expression changed. Fell would be a better word. Why? Maddie was a difficult person to like. She had developed a way about her that was off-putting, even when she was seemingly engaged with others. It seemed that something was always wrong with others, with the world around her, even with us who were trying to help her. Her husband was all too familiar with being the one who was wrong as well. We all turned to Graham, her psychologist, and I asked him what was happening with Maddie. That is when he made the statement. Well, it seems that Maddie still has no interest in having an interior life. I will never forget it. That statement said it all. Maddie had no interest in looking at her internal world, her attitudes, hurts, strengths, her patterns of thinking and behaving, or not trusting and not risking her spiritual life, and maybe most of all, her avoidance of embracing her real suffering and the courage to resolve it. As a result, we all shared the same lack of hope for her, at least at this juncture, as long as she was not going to embrace her interior life, we all knew that her life was not going to change much at all. Whereas with the other people, our task was to help provide paths, skills, and resources for them to embrace and develop their interior and interpersonal world. With Maddie, our task was to get her to see that she has one. 
there really is a life inside of her that gives rise to the external life she complains about every day. That was our task, to get Maddie to see, embrace, and develop her internal life, her real life. Now, I started with this long remembrance, this reflection, because we've started in the past with the story about the stream or the spring. And I thought that this might help us see another way into what our souls are. The people that are described in this reflection, the people working at the psychiatric hospital, what they were doing in large measure was oftentimes helping people heal their souls and find peace and strength in their souls or heal what was broken or burdened in their souls. In fact, the Greek word for soul is psyche. And if you go back and spend some time with what we just read through quickly, you'll see where people are finding ways through the different therapies that they've been through or the different experiences that they've had where they're being able to mend or reharmonize aspects of who they are so that they were able to have breakthroughs or things were changing for them and for the better. Whereas Maddie, what was her problem? She just seemed like she was mad at the world. There was a problem with everything going on around her. And, and what they realized as people working with her for her health and wholeness was that Maddie was not dealing with her inside, her interior life. And she didn't realize that what was going on inside of her, which she wasn't even acknowledging it was, existed, was affecting all the things and all of her outlook on the exterior things going on in her world. So her soul was broken, her soul was troubled, her soul was not healthy. In large measure because she was not even attending to it. She wasn't keeping her soul. She wasn't even acting as if she was aware that she had a soul or had a life outside of what she could see, feel, hear, and all of that. Okay, anybody have any questions? Does this help give another way to look into what we're talking about as we're trying to get a closer view of what our souls are? Okay, um, all of us have, an, back to the handout now, all of us have an outer exterior life and an inner interior life. And as we've said before, the outer life is what's public and visible. It's my accomplishments, my work, my reputation. My inner life is largely invisible. It's where my secret thoughts, hopes, and wishes live. And quite often we get confused as to why we do what we do. Things will happen, They'll, our behaviors will happen, our attitudes will happen, thing, things will manifest, and we don't realize that it's because of what's going on on the inside. We all have issues in life that emanate from our souls, from parts of the soul that have been ignored. It's the human condition, we ignore our internal life. As a result, we do not have the outside life that we desire in terms of our relationships or just how things are going for us, how we're functioning, how well we're doing. We get lost and we need, to, we need help to be reminded to work on the interior, the internal life, the real one, our soul. Questions, anybody? Is this ringing a bell with anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. Understanding the soul, while we may be living in a body or in a context or of a career or a family or community or service, the soul integrates or harmonizes the whole person, the mind, the will, the body, into an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. That's how Dallas Willard put it. It's important to remember that the aspects that the primary aspects that make up who we are, our will, our mind, and our body. Um, they make up this inter these, this in eternal person that we are. And all of those things work together um, and are what come in together as a harmony to be our soul. Our soul is comprised of those things. The soul is the ultimate reality of who we are. We're not just our will. We're not just our minds. We're not just our bodies. We're the compilation of all those things, which we are calling the soul. It's the ultimate reality of who we are past today's circumstance or context. So our soul is eternal. It's not just bound to today and what's happening today and right now. It goes on. The soul is thought of as that which holds a larger entity, uh, for example, a person, an organization, or a team together. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. They'll have people who um, 
for instance, they'll say is the soul of an organization. Um, I think that if we took a poll, there are some people who could say that Sister Carla, for one, is the soul of IT. You know, there's something about her that harmonizes and integrates and brings all of us together to, in correlation um, as an entity, as an organization, as a church, um, and the way that we interact socially. But the soul is that which holds the larger entity together. For the individual, the soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates and integrates into a single life, everything going on in your various dimensions. Your will, and we talked about this last week. Your will, that includes your intentions, your choices, your decisions, and your character. Your mind, that includes your thoughts, your feelings, your memories, your ideas, your feelings, your values desires, reasoning, perceptions, belief, imagination, and conscience. All of those would be part of what we're calling your mind. And your body, that's your face, your facial expressions, your body itself, your body language, your actions, and your interactions with people in the world around you. All right, are y'all with me? A lot of that has been reviewed, but does anybody have any questions about what I'm going over? Are y'all with me? Ask me a question. Oh. <laughs> Page two, Roman numeral three, and I just read letter D. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was an easy question. Thank you for that. Does anybody have any other questions, easy or not so easy? The main point that I'm making, and this is largely review, going over what we've been talking about for the last couple weeks. We are very complex, and we are um, made up of various dimensions that make our whole. And those primary dimensions are our will, our minds, and our bodies. And then the soul is what integrates or harmonizes all those other aspects of us. That's the point that I'm making here, because we're talking about how to be keepers of our souls. But before we get to that, we have to understand what the soul is and how we function. Okay? Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you give us an example of the will, mind, and body in one of our actions? When they're in harmony? Give us both. Okay. So when they're not in harmony, we're going to see in this next handout a little later on what that looks like. But when I say that they're in harmony, um, let's say that, okay, I'm looking at my children because I'm going from what I know about myself as when I'm not in harmony and I'm looking at them when they are in harmony. Okay, so will. Their will when it comes to food, the most inner part of who they are, um, the choices that they make, their intentions, their decisions, who they are without thinking. Their will says that they eat when they're hungry. They're not overeaters. They just eat when they're hungry. They came here programmed like that, and that's how they are. They just eat when they're hungry. Um, the mind, that's the thoughts. And Roman, Roman numeral three, letter D, has the longest list I think I've put together for you for examples of each of those categories. But the mind is where your thoughts, your feelings, your memories, your ideas, your feelings, your values, your desires, your reasonings, perceptions, belief, imagination, and conscience. So when it comes to food and eating, in their minds, they don't have any unusual value attached to food that will override their will or their hunger you know, so my children, one likes chocolate, one doesn't. So if we have ice cream or cake, one wants chocolate, the other wants vanilla. And that's their minds. They have feelings about in their minds and memories in their minds about what they think the value that they've placed on chocolate versus vanilla. But when it comes to their will, the choices or intentions, they're not going to eat chocolate or vanilla if they're not hungry. If the will, what's deep down inside of them, is not hungry, they don't eat, okay? But when the will says hunger, yes, it's time, it, let's get some food, and then they have to put their mind to it, a choice, 
when they have to put their mind to it, think through, and then decide from what the will is saying. Eat, yes. Now, what to eat? The decision on what to eat, that's in their minds, and they're different there. They diverge, but they have harmony within themselves. They're not going to eat unless they're hungry. They don't eat for entertainment. They don't eat for boredom. They don't eat for loneliness. They don't eat for comfort. They eat when they're hungry, you know, period. So the next thing, the body, they're which includes their facial expressions, their body language, their actions, their intentions. Um, they will go to get food when they're hungry. Their bodies will follow through on what their minds and their wills, and they're all working in harmony. The other day I was with them, and um, they didn't want to eat when I thought it was time to eat. And then when they did get hungry, they got real insistent. <laughs> and real loud and I was like well goodness it was almost like it was night and day an hour ago y'all were fine now you're like mommy please pull over and I was like what's going on but then I realized because they're in harmony they don't have a lot of reserves so when they get hungry it hits them and they need food like right away because they don't have a whole lot of extra (laughs) yeah store it up so is that an example does that help you Okay, so let's take that same example with food and look at it when there's disharmony. Okay, sometimes instead of your will, your character, your intentions, um, your decisions, instead of that most inner part of you tapping into hunger, you eat because it's your body's hungry, you're hungry. Instead of that, your will will say, I eat because it looks good. I eat because of all these other reasons that have nothing to do with being hungry. And then your mind will run with that. And so what happens is, since the mind is the place where our desires, desires, the mind is the place where our desires lie. And when we're not in harmony, our desires overpower our will. Now many of us have had this happen. If you are on a diet, or you want to be on a diet, I'm sorry, I'm using my issue, y'all. If you're on a diet or you want to be on a diet and your will says, I want to lose weight, but your desire is for food, food, and more food, 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 and glorious food, or a particular food, or a food at a particular time, or food a particular way, it will overpower the will. Your mind and your desire will overpower the will, and then you find yourself in that Romans 7 Situation: The good I would do, I didn't do. I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. That's when you're not in harmony. And then the other thing that happens is when the, the will is very easy to overpower, you know, because the mind will get hold of it and then pull the body in as an ally to do what it wants to do. The mind will get the body in on it, and then it's two against one. And the will may be saying, hey, wait, I don't want to do it. But by that time, the mind, the mind has said, I want it, I want it, I got to have it. And the body has already started serving it up or driving through the drive through or eating the food. And then you look up and say, wait a minute, I didn't want to do that. But your body has taken over where your, where your mind and its intense desire that was disordered with the will has then... Um, put it those things in motion am I making sense y'all and the part that where you experience that disconnect is in your soul when you feel defeated when you walk away like oh crushed and you know how we feel when we're in that place where we're not doing what we want to do and we are doing what we don't want to do are y'all following me now so if I'm walking around with a soul that is disordered like that or in disharmony like that When I get home, all of a sudden, the least little thing might just be working my nerves. And it has nothing to do with what that person did. It's what my soul was already burdened with when I came into the house. I'm already upset. I'm already off balance. And then add to that, I got on the palmetto. And then add to that, it was raining. And then add to that, I had to go to the bank, and then I got there, and the ATM wasn't working. So I had to get out of the car, and you see what I'm saying? Does that help, Sister Carla? Okay. And one of the other things that just makes all of this 
that much more challenging is hurry. When we have to rush and do things, even people with the most healthy souls, when they're rushed or have to rush, will find themselves off balance, disintegrated, not in integration, you know, and out of harmony and out of sorts. Have you ever gotten up in the morning and just had your quiet time and all is well with the world and then all of a sudden you look up and you are 20 minutes behind? And then everything that you, all that peace, all that joy, all that love, everything that you had, that you thought you had, it just goes out the window. Because hurry is a way, is, has a way of just, just attacking our souls. And in our culture, that is one of the main ways that we end up showing out and the brokenness of our souls. Pe more people get special hand signals when we're rushing during rush hour, special hand signals. They show up there more than any other time. More honking because hurry is a disruptor of our souls, okay? Any questions or comments, anybody? All right. So now we are on Roman numeral four. Why do I need to be aware of my soul, though? All this stuff can be going on, and you have no idea. When you've been feeling out of sorts, did you have any idea that your soul was out of harmony? Well, why should we be aware? This is a review this quote, the soul is like an inner stream of water. This takes us back to that first allegory when we talked about the stream or the spring. The soul is like an inner stream of water that gives strength, direction, and harmony to every other element of our life. When that stream is as it should be, we are constantly refreshed and exuberant in all we do because our soul itself is then profusely rooted in the vastness of God and his kingdom, including nature. And all else within us is enlivened and directed by that stream. Therefore, we are in harmony with God, reality, and the rest of human nature, and nature at large. So when our souls are at rest, and when our souls are strong and healthy, it's when we are rooted in God, God's blessings, God's grace, and God's kingdom. Questions, anybody? Okay, so on page three at the top, each part of a human being must be healthy and working as God intended it to, and that's what makes a healthy soul. When God created us, he created us with an order, and it encompassed all those elements of who we are. And he ordered how those elements are to interact and how all of, all of those elements together as the soul are to interact with him and with his kingdom and his creation. Our souls are healthy when they are in harmony with how God created us to be, okay? What matters most, what marks our existence the really deep reason why human life matters so much is because of this tiny, fragile, vulnerable, precious thing about us called our soul. And it's fragile because, you know, anything can kind of trip or trigger. Like I was saying, you could be, you know, just in a moment of great peace and joy and then have something happen that will just trigger your soul to be troubled or um, in disharmony. Understanding the above, all those things we just talked about, becomes a wake-up call that can then motivate us to do what Maddie, the Maddie in us, sometimes does not want to do. If you're walking around feeling out of sorts, angry all the time, frustrated, quick to pop off at somebody, or just road rage, just anger, do you ever get tired of just being irritated all the time? Well... That sounds to me how, and I think it's, it's cute that they named her Maddie. I don't know if that was her real name, but, you know, mad all the time. Sometimes we don't want to face it, but when we realize that that's going on with us, it's a wake-up call. We need to take an interest 
and take an inventory of what's going on inside of us, what's going on in our internal life. We need to take a diligent interest in, in and stewardship of this life, this interior life that God has breathed, this soul. Who has a question or a comment about that? I think when we come next time, I'm going to give you a, um, a quiz to take to evaluate where you are in terms of how your soul is. Is it where you are in terms of the peace or the health of your soul? Why y'all laughing? You're not coming. <laughs> That's all right. We know where you live. <laughs> we all need for someone from time to time to wake up the Maddie in us and remind us. Wake up, y'all. And remind us to, t to make sure that we're doing what the creator of this life tells us to do so that the life that God gave us will continue into more and more life. That scripture reference there, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So our life in Christ is not supposed to be something that we endure. Yes, ma'am. say um I don't know if it's on it's on okay. <laughs> um I used to be and I say used to be because I believe God has delivered me amen amen a warrior mm -hmm. you know just constantly anxious about everything uh -huh. and um and when you're anxious you also become nervous. You know, it's so you're not settled in your spirit and your soul is not settled. And just like you said, regardless of you may have had a great worship, you know, that morning, but you're still anxious and worried about well, what's going to happen next and is this going to happen and um, just a whole lot of different things. Mm -hmm. But um, I just thank God that He gave me this book to read. Um, it's called Anxious for Nothing. Mm -hmm. And I must say, it really just settled me out. But how does that, I guess, and you can talk to it even more, when we worry and we're anxious, our spirits are settled. Yeah, it definitely is a reflection of where we are in our souls. Now, remember what we said in... At the very top of the page, each of, each part of the human being must be healthy. And that's what makes our souls healthy. So when our when the aspects of us are working as God intends it to, that's when you can see how a commandment like Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. Well, how do you do that? The only way to do that is in the kingdom of God. And God created us to rely completely on him. And if you go back and read, you can read across the scripture, but just focus on the, on the gospels and you'll see times in people's lives, times in the disciples' lives when they were worrying and what Jesus did and how Jesus responded and, you know, the Bible says, Jesus told them, if you want to see the Father, look at me. You've seen me, so you've seen the Father. So, for instance, when the disciples were on that boat with Jesus and the storm came and Jesus was asleep. Now, we know that Jesus lived a life with a completely healthy and whole soul. He was completely in harmony with the Father at all times. So what does a healthy soul looks, look like? How does a healthy soul look even in a storm? It's at peace. So much so that he was asleep. Now the disciples are running around like their hair is on fire. And he says, oh, you of what? Little faith. Our faith is what connects us to the reality of God's kingdom and who God is and God's character and God's love and God's grace. Little faith means 
you may have, I heard someone teaching about this recently, you may have faith enough to believe that God can deliver you to heaven one day. But do you have faith enough to know that on a ship with a storm raging, the same God who can get you to heaven one day can keep you safe and can keep you in his hand in the midst of the storm? So the reason why Jesus can command things like be anxious for nothing is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's an imperative statement because he's speaking from one who is fully human he knows the temptations that we face, but he also knows in his humanness, his humanity, he knows the faithfulness of God. And that's where our souls are to rest in the faithfulness of God. We can look throughout the scripture at God's faithfulness to his people. And then what we ought to start doing is writing the 67th book of the Bible, the gospel according to Maria or to Pat or to Sandra or Pokey, <laughs> and write the episodes that you've lived through where God has shown his faithfulness. And then reread that, rehearse that, remember that in the moments when your, your mind is thinking about being anxious or when your will has decided I'm going to be more in more awe of the storm than the God who's in control of the elements go back to your memories recall who God is preach that gospel to yourself and then peace be still the storm can rage but I know who controls the storm, and bigger than that, I know who's, whose hands I'm in. Does that make sense? So one of the things that has to happen in terms of believers, because, you know, people who are unbelievers, um, they're not going to have this way to, to order and reorder their souls to a place of peace. If you don't believe God is God, if you don't believe there's a God, how can you realign yourself, your will, your mind, your body to what God intended? You don't even believe that there is a God. But for us who are his children, for us who have confessed him and his son, we have the truths of God present in our experience. I'm going to go to my Wesleyan um, my Wesleyan roots, our experience, our rational thought, our traditions. Hmm? I always forget the fourth one. Experience, reason. Oh, in scripture, of course, in scripture. Those are the four ways that we can renew our souls to help us remember who God is and to walk in that harmony with the truth of who God is. Am I making sense? So yeah, we, we do, but if you don't even, if you don't even acknowledge that something's going on that's causing you to be anxious or that something's going on inside of you that is nurturing anxiety, because sometimes we nurture anxiety, right? If you're like Maddie and you just lashing out and you're just, everybody's wrong, everybody's a problem and not dealing with, well, what's going on in my, in my will? Where have I decided? What choices have I made that have taken God off the throne? Or what's going on in my mind? What desires do I have? What um, thoughts, prejudices, What's going on inside of me, in my mind, my thoughts, my perceptions that have taken God off the throne? What behaviors, what actions am I taking that have taken God off the throne? How are those things working together to not know the truth of the God who's on the throne? That's the disintegration, the disharmony that we're talking about. Does that help, y'all? Really? Who has a question? Okay, the it's called generally called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. 
So what we do as Methodists is that we, so we don't get too far afield in what we're believing and espousing. We keep four things in tension. Scripture, reason, tradition, and I always, when I <laughs> I always get to the fourth one, we get scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Thank you. I don't know why. It doesn't matter what order I call them out in. And when I get to the fourth one, I always forget. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? How are we doing on time? So we, as Methodists, we keep those in tension. We don't go too far afield with tradition. Because we know some traditions just can get so far from reason, they just don't even make sense. And why are we still doing that? <laughs> we keep scripture. But even with scripture, we don't proof text. Or we don't um, take things so literally that we don't use reason and experience. Right? We keep those four in tension. And that keeps us from going too far afield one way or the other. All right? That was a bonus. Okay, so what else? Any other questions or comments? Okay, so we need this wake-up call from time to time. Sister Carla, be here next week when we do the, um, <laughs> we do the quiz. You don't have to turn it in. It's for your own edification. Don't be maddy. <laughs> we all need for someone to, from time to time to wake up the maddy in us and remind us to make sure that we're doing what the creator of this life tells us to do so that the life God gave us will continue into more and more life. We all have issues that emanate from our souls, from parts of, of the soul that have been ignored. There's stuff going on that we're not even cognizant of and that we've ignored or we've just stopped paying attention to. It's the human condition. We ignore our internal life and as a result, we do not have the outside life that we desire, relationally or functionally. As a soul, a soul is healthy when there is harmony. Remember that, when there's harmony in the will, the mind, and the body, and when they are well-ordered and functioning within God's intention for all creation. We were created for a purpose. God had a purpose and a reason for creating us. And there are aspects of us because we're complex, but we have healthy souls when our, the aspects of us are in harmony with, the, with themselves, within our soul, and when, our, when they're lined up with what God intends for us. Okay? So, here's an example. You've probably heard this before. We've talked about how um, a lot of times churches are run on the willing worker model. Whoever's willing does the work. But when you don't operate in your spiritual gifts, the things that God gave you that are particular, your gifts and talents, then you're going to be off kilter. Your soul is not going to be healthy and whole. And that's not only going to affect you, it's going to affect the church, the body of Christ. So you've heard, I'm sure you've heard this over the years, Pastor and I have used this before, how there's a choir member, let's say a praise team member, not here because we have the best praise team ever. But there's a praise team member who can sing, but she's a really good cook. But she wants to be a singer, so she's in the praise team. There's a cook who can't cook, but is a really good singer. But she wants to be a cook, so instead of being in the praise team, she's in the kitchen. The food she's cooking is awful, and the noise that she's making <laughs> She may be joyful, but everybody else is just like, what? Because they're not operating in their gifts. And they're not operating in the gifts that reflect God's intentions for them in those areas. So what happens? The whole body is a little bit off. The, the people who come to worship are like, mm, a little distracted by what's going on with that praise team member who really can't sing but always wants a solo. And then when we eat a meal, we're off balance because something ain't right in the kitchen. So not only are their souls <laughs> off, but the body gets a little bit off. Y'all get that? Okay. 
So a soul is healthy when there is harmony between the will, the mind, and the body, when they're well-ordered and functioning within God's intention for all creation. So the troubled soul, when on the outside we do something, on the inside we don't want to do, there's a conflict, a lack of harmony between our interior and exterior selves. I gave you that example already with um, the example of the harmony that the boys have with how they eat and the disharmony that so often. And then <laughs> that's when our inner lives are not integrated with our outer lives. Something's going on on the inside. You know, I remember once when, um, when I was a reporter and I used to cover the Coca-Cola company and there was a lady there and she said to me that working in public relations made her not a good Christian. And what she was really telling me was that, you know, they're called spin doctors sometimes. There were things that she had to say and... Um, party lines that she had to echo and spin control that she sometimes had to do that she was had an inner conflict over as a Christian she didn't believe that she should be bending the truth or spinning the truth or whatever and maybe this wasn't the best example because I don't know Coke isn't one of those companies that, that was doing that like some of the other companies I was covering like the tobacco companies <laughs> but anyway you see how what was happening on her outside was causing her conflict because of what she knew was right on the inside. She was a believer, and she knew that she was doing things that lacked integrity, that didn't line up with who she was in Christ. But that stuff happens all the time, and we don't always feel um, conflicted about it. And that's when it's really become an embodied situation. You know, when we can just do stuff that we know we used to know we had no business doing, but we just do it now because it's just part of what I do. Everybody else does it. It's embodied, it's, it's gotten ingrained in my body. I can do it without even thinking about it. I can do it without even having any type of um, guilt about it. And that's a problem because that's when we are just completely on autopilot and our bodies are just, that's the sin living in my members the sin that's just residing in my body. My body can do it. My body can take toilet paper rolls from, from my job because everybody else does it. Now I can be in church every Sunday and know thou shalt not steal. But my body can go ahead and load up. <laughs> Y'all laughing. <laughs> but, but that happens and that's a disordering of the soul. And even if we're not immediately conscious of the fact that it's causing a problem for us, Ultimately, it is because there's a disharmony between what we know and what who we are and what we're doing. Am I making sense? Okay. Questions? Okay. Comment? Okay. <laughs> and sometimes even parts of our interior world do not seem to be inter integrated or in harmony. Yeah, that's... That's another thing. Like one day I'm I'm A, next day I'm B. Okay, no, today I'm B, and then tomorrow I'm A. I can't even keep my mind straight on where am I for it, am I against it? Or the example that I gave earlier about the food, like I know that I'm not hungry, but I'm eating it anyway. The will, the will and the mind being out of sync. Any questions or comments, anybody? I'm going to stop talking about food. <laughs> it's just an easy one to talk about. Will we ever become perfect in harmony as one? Not on this side of the Jordan. <laughs> However, we have a power, the power of the resurrected Christ in us to be much more integrated than most of us are. Because you know what? Most of us don't even really think about this stuff too much, right? It's not something that the church deals with or talks about a whole lot. We get a whole lot of sometimes. We get a whole lot of thou shalt not. But we don't get an understanding of why I keep doing what I know thou shalt not. Now we can testify when we hear Paul talk about the things I would do, I don't, and all of that. All of us can identify but that's not where we're supposed to stay. 
And if you keep reading in Romans, Paul doesn't stay there. He's talking about a moment in time. And then he gets to, to chapter 8, and that thing is turned around. And he realizes that in Christ, there is no condemnation. And he doesn't have to stay stuck. Christ is his way out of being in that disharmony. And Christ is his way by, by grace into the healthy soul. But will there always be things that we have to battle? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we battle in the power of God. Would we consider ourselves unstable? I think that's exactly what um, letter B at the top of this one was talking about. What matters most, what marks your existence, the really deep reason why human life matters so much is because of this tiny, fragile, vulnerable, precious thing about you called your soul. And I think that's exactly why we're unstable. If we're not even aware of our souls, and you know, this is not a, um, a judgment that it's tiny, fragile, vulnerable, or precious. That's part of what makes humanity special and unique. But it also is part of what makes us tossed and driven. It's part of what makes us um, susceptible to the attacks of the enemy or the, the lust of the eyes, the pride, the pride of life. Okay? So absolutely. But when our when we're, our souls are anchored in the Lord, our anchor is the grace of God that keeps us. But what we're going to see is when we're trying to do all this on our own, that in and of itself makes our souls unhealthy. Okay? Remember now, we were created to be dependent on God. And the moment that we stepped out and tried to do things on our own and determine on our own how things should be, that's the time and that is the condition, that sinful condition is what causes this soul problem. Because we're not doing what we were intended, which was to be dependent on God and in interrelationship with him. Sister Pat, there's a mic out there somewhere. That statement that you just made, we were created to be dependent on God. Right. That just resonated in my soul right there. So many times we are so focused on doing it our way with our strength. That's and right. I, I think if we can keep that in the forefront, God wants me to be dependent on him. Absolutely. He does he's not like our earthly parents who wants us to be independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, um, I heard it said this way. When Satan told Eve and Adam that um, if you eat that fruit, it'll make you like God, they believed it. And then they continue, and we continue to judge ourselves by that lie. Why am I anxious? Well, I have all these bills, and I don't have the money. Well, and I know I don't have the resources. I, 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 self, 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 self. Well, I am not supposed to be able to handle all of that by myself, on my own. But I'm going to judge the situation as if I should be a god over that situation. Like the nice snake said, I should be able to handle this. What's the problem? There must be something wrong with me. Because the snake wouldn't lie to me, that nice snake. Right? Sister Krosky? I am um, kind of thinking about the fact that we do nothing, we don't do anything within ourselves, that everything happens. God is it's happening because he's allowing it to happen. But somehow we seem to get the big head or think we're doing something. We're actually not doing anything. So somewhere down the line, we lose perspective that it's not us. 
It's actually God's doing it, but we're not giving him the credit, giving him the thanks and giving him the glory for what's happening in our lives. Somehow we're taking that on into ourselves that, you know, Vern Krosky did this, or Gwen did this, uh, Sister Pat did this, when actually we're not doing anything. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord, right? And we like to take credit for things as if we did it. You know, and that's the society that we live in. You know, you can have somebody showing up and showing you that you've been bankrupt a bunch of times, you don't know how to talk to people, you're a sexual predator, you have um, serious mental health issues, and then you can think that you are qualified and successful enough to be president. You didn't see that? But all of us have those type of delusions going on in our world. And then we try to medicate our way into maintaining those delusions. Okay, I really can't handle my money on my own. And then to make matters worse, I stop tithing if I ever did tithe because I need this money because I'm, I'm trying to handle this. And then that stress is making me overeat because I can't handle it, but I'm supposed to handle it because I'm strong. I've got a college education. I live in the right subdivision. You know what I'm saying? And all that stuff is built on nothing. And it's not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be drawing everything from the Lord. Everything. There's a question behind the camera. Nice and loud. Absolutely. Absolutely. We talked about that, I think, a couple weeks ago. I called them, I said I heard someone call them vampire Christians, that people want the blood of Christ to get them into heaven. But that's it. I just want them for the blood to get me into heaven. But for my everyday life, and I heard somebody say it this way, do, you, do we think that God is really that um, psychopathic, that, you know, just that insane, that he um, would get us into heaven, but then not care of whether or not we had food to eat while we're here? Would he bless us with children and then not care how we clothe them? Is he that much of a nut job, somebody said, that, that God would just, you know, save us to the uttermost, but then everything that happens to you get over there, you're on your own? But part of that comes from, we go back to the quadrilateral, Scripture tells a different story, right? A totally different story. And um, our cultural and collective witness as a community tells a different story. That's why testimonies are so important. We need to stop acting like I, I woke up like this, <laughs> right? Okay, we're almost out of time. Any other questions or comments? Can we zip through the rest of this? I think we already um, have covered most of what the last part of the handout is. The last part of the handout is taking a look at the troubled soul. And when on the outside we do something on the inside, I already said that Roman numeral five, letter B, letter C. Sometimes I said that one too. Okay, so this is just going through number one under C, under Roman numeral five. It's telling us what the will is. And the will has the power to do what is good or evil. We will use the will primarily in the power to select what we think on and how intently we focus on it. And our other decisions and actions then more or less directly flow from there. So our will is very much focused, very much influenced by what we think about, what we focus on. Okay, when they were alone in the garden with the Lord, 
interacting with God and God alone, they were cool. But when they took their focus off the Lord and started interacting with that nice snake who would never lie to them, that's when they ended up in trouble. Okay? I have some scripture references there for you. Um, Somehow, on the handout, I didn't get them in all the other aspects of us, but I have them here, and I'll be happy to make copies for you if you want them. For the mind, your mind is your thoughts. We have five minutes. Feelings, memories, ideas, that long list. And it represents the power we have over our, that should be our thoughts. Um, The power we have over our thoughts assists us in directing and controlling our feelings, which are not directly under the guidance of our will. So how our mind gets input from the will, but then it, it directs, it has a power of its own to direct and control things like our feelings and our thinking. The body, we talked about what that is. It's our primary energy source and the focal point of our presence in the physical and social world. The body is the original and primary place of our dominion. We talked about that before. The body is the one place on earth, our bodies, where we have control. Okay. Um, The soul, that's the dimension of us that's interrelated with all the other dimensions so that we form one life. And it's the most basic level of life in the individual. And it is by nature rooted in God. It's the deepest part of the person and has the capacity to operate without conscious supervision. Stuff can be going on in your soul without you being consciously aware of it. That's why you need to be awakened. That's why the Maddies in us need to come next week and take some, take some assessments to figure out if we need to pay attention to some things. Now, I have another handout here that I'll pass out. We won't have time to talk about it. But this handout, and we'll we'll start with this next time, and then we'll also do the quiz. And we'll make the quiz available for anybody who's watching online so you can download it and access it too. This handout gives you characteristics of a harmonious mind or Um, a mind that's not in harmony. It's actually labeled characteristics of the disintegrated mind and of the integrated mind. And we do, the handout gives you that for the will, the body, and the soul. So just real quick, a disintegrated mind, it's a mind apart from God. And it becomes a wild mix of thought and feelings manifested in willful stupidities, blatant inconsistencies, and confusions. With a mind that's disintegrated or not in harmony, we equate God with our limited ideas about God. And so we fail to know what God is really like and what God's law requires. We actively crowd God out of our thoughts and the mind is trapped by destructive ideas and images about both God and ourselves. We're mastered and enslaved by feelings and believe our feelings must be satisfied. Now, there's a whole lot of that going on. Many of us run our lives based on our feelings. And our feelings, now remember, that's the mind, and it's not supposed to be, actually, this is, I should have started with the will, but the, the feelings are not supposed to be in control of what we, what we do and what we are. Um, So by contrast, the healthy mind is being constantly transformed. Reverend, that's what we were talking about. It never, you don't always arrive. And even if you do reach a certain height, you have to keep on doing it over and over again, allowing your mind to be transformed and renewed. It is increasingly characterized by hope, faith, love, joy, and peace, the fruit of the spirit. This is the mind that's in harmony. Um, we desire to be conformed to the mind of Christ. We actually desire it. The desire to be like Christ is what is the prevailing desire in our lives, not a desire to do something that just because it's going to feel good or taste good or some other sensual thing. So we desire to be conformed to the mind of Christ and move toward a total exchange of our own ideas for his ideas. We apply our mind to truth by consistently taking the word of God, taking it in, dwelling on it, pondering its meaning, and exploring its implication for our lives. 
Do you hear how these things are talking about the ways that we stay in line with what God intends for us, the relationship God intends for us? We renew our minds. We let Christ's thoughts be our, our thoughts, um, things like that. So when you get this handout, just remember to flip it over. It should start. You should probably start with the will first and then read the mind, then the body, then the soul. Okay? Does anybody have any questions or comments? Our time is up. But we'll be back next week, and we'll do a little assessment. And we'll spend a little time on this handout when we get, back, get together next time. Any questions or comments, anybody? All right. Well, let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for this time. We thank you, O oh God, for opening our eyes. We thank you, O oh God, for taking us into revelations and thoughts that we may not have considered before. But we pray that you be glorified in this journey that we're taking today and that we be made more like Jesus for having done it. Thank you, God, for this Emmanuel Temple, this kingdom movement. We pray for those who are healing and who will continue to, to battle grief. We thank you, God, for the many ways that you're blessing us to be a blessing. We ask that you continue to bless our Love Out Loud activities and the things that we have upcoming. And we want to give you all the glory for being our God and our source and our supply. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.